series. Um, while I know we're anxious to hear from our speaker, um, I just wanted to take a brief moment to thank those who have contributed to today's event. First, I want to thank the Honors Program, the Humanities Department, and the Think Center for creating the lecture series several years ago. Their initiative garnered increased popularity and, for the first time this year, has grown into a division-wide initiative. I'd like to give a very special thanks to Joe Chewbacca. His generosity has made this division-wide event possible. Thank you so much for your support. Tracy Rowe, Kristen Williams, Wynn Nagel, Catherine Boyez, and Lee Corbin. This has truly been a grassroots initiative, and these individuals have dedicated their time, energy, and creativity in putting today's event together for everyone. Thank you so much for your hard work. Now, I have the absolute honor of introducing our speaker. Greg Taylor, a North Carolina resident, falsely accused and incarcerated for murder in 1993. He spent 17 years in prison for a crime he did not commit. While incarcerated, he fought for his innocence and obtained his degree. In 2010, Greg Taylor was declared innocent and was the first inmate to be exonerated by North Carolina's Innocence Inquiry Commission. His remarkable story has been covered by WRAL, CNN, The New York Times, The LA Times, and he's appeared on a number of news shows including Anderson Cooper's show, Anderson Live. Please welcome me, or join me in welcoming Mr. Taylor to Wake Tech. Sorry about that. I, I tend to pace, so, uh, but never wider than a, a 60 square foot area which is what I'm used to. So uh, um, th thanks everybody for, uh, for coming out today and, and uh, thank Wake Tech for, for setting this up and for the streaming and everything. And um, uh, all, all I can say is coming out to this campus and, and, and standing in front of you guys, it, you know, Wake Tech has changed an awful lot since I first attended in 1984. Um, in 1984, I was just married I had a uh, one-year-old daughter, and I began uh, uh, my education after my wife had finished uh, college at NC State. Wake Tech is where I, where I began, and I ended up in uh, D.C. finishing up some, uh, some uh, electronics curriculums and going to work in the electronics industry. So uh, along about 1991, we had moved back to North Carolina. I was living in Cary. I had a wife. I had an eight-year-old daughter. I had a career in telecommunications, uh, two cars and a boat, two cats and a dog. And we you know, lived uh, suburban life, uh, weekends on Lake Jordan, vacations camping. And uh, that was pretty much my life at the time. In uh, September of 1991, I was out partying one night with an acquaintance and got a truck stuck in the mud, and, which is the reason why I'm here today. So uh, the next morning when I went to get this vehicle, there were police all around the area looking at a body that they had found in a cul-de-sac about 100 yards from where my truck was stuck off the road. I approached an officer and I, I told him, you know, in, in my naivety, that I had a vehicle stuck back there and I asked him how long it would be before I could get it out. The officer said that he didn't know that I would have to speak with uh, one of the detectives. And so, uh, you know, about this time I look up and I see this group of uh, men in, in coats and ties walking across the uh, cul-de-sac where the, where the body was found. And one of these gentlemen stepped out of the crowd and introduced himself as Detective Johnny Howard. And I asked him the same thing I'd asked the officer, how long would it be before I could get my vehicle? Detective Howard said that they were conducting this investigation. They didn't know how long it would be and would I mind answering any questions. I told him I don't know anything, but I would be glad to help in any way I could. 
So I met him at the police station and he proceeded to conduct uh, an interrogation, uh, starting off with asking me everything that I had done and everybody I was with from the time I had gotten off work the, night be the day before until I arrived at the cul-de-sac that morning. And I told him everything I possibly could and um, he said, you know, we're gonna check all this out. I said, check it out, you'll just see that I'm telling the truth. He said, well, will you take a polygraph? I said, yes, I'll take a polygraph, but then they wouldn't give me one. Um, the interrogation uh, got more into the particulars and he started asking me questions, you know, about the certain people that I was with. Uh, one person in particular, the person I was with when I got the vehicle stuck in the mud, his name was Johnny Beck, and he, would, he was going through um, the list of people that I had named, asking me if they were black or were they white. When I mentioned that Johnny Beck was black, you, he could not hide the look in his eyes of the, the, the surprise, and right then the interrogation took a turn to be more accusatory. Um, he started saying things like he had witnesses that say things a little bit different, um, I said, well, they can't say that we were involved in anything because we weren't. He said, no telling what we're gonna find when we search that vehicle. I said, here's the keys to my truck. Search it, you won't find anything from the victim in it. He said, you know we're gonna check all this out. I said, check it out, you'll just see that I'm telling the truth. So we left the police station. We went to my house where I let him search my house from top to bottom. He gathered anything he wanted, including the clothes that I wore the night before and these little pocket knives I had collected since I was like 10 years old, including a Boy Scout pocket knife. I mean, just anything he wanted, that he, could, he got. And um, then we go back to the police station and the interrogation took a different turn at that point. It became more accusatory, uh, he would leave me in a room for 30 minutes, an hour by myself, come in, say things like, we know you did it, uh, we have witnesses, we have evidence, why don't you tell us the truth? We don't wanna see you going to prison for something somebody else might have done. What's your daughter gonna think when she sees you on death row? Um, at one point he came in uh, the interrogation room and he says, we found Johnny Beck, which Johnny Beck wasn't hiding and I took the uh, police by Johnny Beck's house. But in any case, that was when I learned that they had had Johnny Beck in another interrogation room. And uh, Detective Howard comes in, in my room and he says, Johnny Beck was the smart one. He told us that you did it. And I said, well, I didn't do it. And he says, well, why does Johnny Beck say you did? I said, I don't know, ask him, but I know that neither one of us had any part of this crime. And come to find out, of course, Johnny Beck never said anything like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the, the, in, 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 the interrogation at that point was basically him accusing me and me saying I didn't do it. And every time I felt helpless by his accusations, I would ask for an attorney. So four times I asked for an attorney. All four times, the interrogation just kept on going. But whenever he offered me an opportunity to prove I was innocent, I jumped at that opportunity. I gave him hairs from my head, I gave him blood, I gave him saliva, and I'd already took him to my house, gave him the keys to my truck, and told him everything I knew, agreed to take a polygraph. I don't know what more I could have done. At the end of the day, Johnny Beck and I were both arrested for first degree murder and put into jail with no bond. And you know, we were two people who hardly even knew each other, but both of us knew that we didn't have any part of that crime and we were just left to uh, face the charges. So with that, my uh, wife had to become an expert in attorneys uh, almost immediately. And the next morning I was met by a, a gentleman I was familiar with the name. His name is Jim Blackburn. And Jim Blackburn at the time 
was a defense attorney, but I knew of his name because back in the um, mid 80s, there was a movie called Fatal Vision. And this movie was about the uh, conviction of Dr. Jeffrey McDonald of murdering his family in Fort Bragg back in 1970 it was a very high profile case. And Jim Blackburn was the federal prosecutor who convicted him. And in the movie, Jim Blackburn was portrayed as very effectively arguing physical evidence and convincing the jury to convict Jeffrey McDonald. And I believed I needed somebody like that on my side, somebody who would get the physical evidence reports and argue effectively with the police, the prosecutor, or whoever it may be to get these charges dropped, this case dismissed so that I could get on with my life and so that the police could find out whoever did it. Um, eventually I got bond and I was out on bond in August of 1992 when I called Jim Blackburn and asked him what he was doing on my case. Um, I had at this point been arrested for almost a year. Uh, he hasn't met with any prosecutor, any police, and I told him that maybe I needed to be on his doorstep at 8 a.m. every morning to see what he's going to do on my case. He said that if I wasn't happy with his representation, that I could get another attorney. I said, well, well give me my money back then. And he said, I can't do that. So I said, I guess I'm stuck with you. Um, in January of 1993, I found out why he couldn't give me my money back and I was called into the office of his law firm and informed that Jim Blackburn was under arrest for stealing money from the law firm, that uh, he had uh, forged some judge's signatures on court documents to make it look like he was doing work and surrendered his law license. Uh, he eventually pled guilty to a whole series of felonies, went to prison himself. That's who I had represented me for the first 15 months of my case. But in January 1993, this left me with no attorney. I found another attorney. This other attorney uh, said that he reviewed everything in my case. And at that point, he was ready to go to trial in April of 1993. He called me into his office shortly before the trial. He says, Greg, it's just like you said, there's nothing there. A judge ought to throw this case out, but if not, I don't see a jury in the world of convicting you. I know you want to prove you're innocent, but that's not our job. That it's the prosecution's job to prove your guilt, and they can't do it. So he went on to explain how the best thing that he could do in my case was nothing. And by that, I mean that he would allow the prosecution to present its case in its entirety and then in return not present any evidence whatsoever. So if the prosecution presents its case, the defense presents no evidence, then the defense gets the last closing argument, which he felt that would be beneficial and um, sewing up this acquittal, that's if this case made it to the jury. Um, I have a background in electronics, telecommunications, computers. I know nothing about the system, nothing about the law. Um, this particular lawyer was educated, he was experienced, and I felt it was my place to go by his advice, which we paid for, and to allow him to do his job as best he saw fit. But nevertheless, you know, there was this voice, you know, and speaking loudly as a sports fan even, how can the best defense be no defense? You know, that worked real well for Carolina against Virginia Tech last week, right? So uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, kind of questioned him a little bit about that. You know, and he says, he says, I don't have a problem with putting you on the stand. He said, but that's not what we're going to do. So uh, my trial consisted of the prosecution presenting its case in its entirety. No defense, closing arguments, 
Less than two hours later, jury coming back and convicting me of first degree murder. I was sentenced to the rest of my natural life in prison on April 19th, 1993. This was in Wake County, and I was led out of a courtroom, placed in handcuffs and shackles, and put in a holding cell, and transported to Central Prison off of Western Boulevard, a place that I had ridden by even as little as being five or six years old, when my mom would point to it and say, that's where they send the bad people. I'd ridden by it late at night when I was a teenager, early 20s or whatever, out partying, knowing with everything that I know about myself that there was no way that I was gonna end up behind those walls. But there I went. The first thing you do is you go into uh, what they call shipping and receiving, which is uh, for inmates instead of cargo. And I uh, was stripped, searched everywhere you can be searched put on prison clothes, and that's what I wore for the next 6,149 days. Uh, when I first went to prison, I believed that if somebody somewhere had the wisdom to see that I was innocent and the authority to do something about it, then I would be home in a week or two. I was anxious about the appellate process and getting into court I knew that there was no way that a court would uphold this conviction. Uh, my attorney, trial attorney, came to see me the day after I was convicted and said as much. He said that it would be 12 months at least and 15 months at most before the North Carolina Supreme Court overturned my conviction. So with that, I settled down at Central Prison and then at Nash Correctional. Um, for the next 12 to uh, 15 months. Um, while I was at Nash Correctional, I enrolled in school, a uh, class called Industrial Electricity Motors and Controls. I stayed in this class, um, what ended up being until 1995. Uh, at that point, my appeal for the North Carolina Supreme Court was turned down. I earned a, a technical diploma in this class. Then I enrolled in a uh, computer technology class, earned an associate's degree. Then I enrolled in uh, electronic engineering, earned another associate's degree. Then I enrolled in a HVAC class and earned CFC certification. I took some math classes and some additional classes on top of that. So I have over 200 and something hours at Nash Correctional <laughs> Institution uh, via Nash Community College and uh, with a 4.0 GPA because there was nothing better to do than study. So uh, that was my life up until uh, 1999 and when I became the first teacher's aide at Nash Correctional. And uh, this allowed me access of the school for two hours um, every day. I, uh, Learned, taught myself computer programming, which is what I do today. And um, I stayed in that job until November of 2000 when I was transferred to Johnston Correctional Institution. Um, up until that time at Nash Correctional, I had been pretty much in a single cell. I was able to close the door to prison life. I stayed to myself. I didn't understand anything about this world, the officers, the inmates, anything. The best thing that could happen to me was to be left alone and just to be the thought invisible. And that's how I lived my life up until 2000. But when I went to Johnston Correctional, I was in a dorm, which was about like a, a double wide trailer, had 34 bunks in it, and um, I didn't get to choose the other 33 people. So there was a lot, of, uh, a lot about prison that um, I was uncomfortable with. I still tried to stay to myself, developed some routines. I went to work in the library where I stayed almost nine and a half years. I um, uh, read a lot of books, almost a thousand. Never saw a computer during that time and spent a lot of time on the exercise yard and wherever somebody was in a line, I was always somebody, somewhere else. So, uh, you know, all during this time, 
I was fighting my case. I fought it all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and was turned down at every level. In 2003, I applied for DNA testing. Wake County Judge Donald Stevens turned that motion down without a hearing. So I, at, when I was denied DNA testing, that was the end of my hope in court, and I was realistically looking at dying in prison. I uh, wrote a letter to this organization called the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence, which is a nonprofit organization out of Durham, and they investigate claims of innocence. And if they find merit in it, then they uh, give this case to the law students, and the law students gets all the discovery material that they can get and determine if there's a way to get back into court. North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence found that there was no way to get me back in court, although they 100% believed in my innocence. Um, but along about this time, in uh, 2007, there, uh, there was a new entity in North Carolina called the Innocence Inquiry Commission. This was a, a legislated process, uh, government-empowered commission that had the ability to do a, a no stone unturned investigation. They had subpoena power. They had uh, the uh, ability to do the DNA test and do everything that they needed in my case to determine the truth. And at the end of their investigation, they present their case to an eight-member panel. And this eight-member panel consists of law enforcement, prosecutors, judges, defense attorneys, members of the community. And they hear the investigators' findings and then make a ruling as to the merit of innocence. If they rule in your favor, then the case is sent to a three-judge panel. And the three-judge panel listens to arguments from both sides, the defense and the prosecutor, hears everything about the case, including what had been omitted from the original trial and what could not have been present, presented through the appellate process over the years. So in February of 2010, my case was heard in front of a three-judge panel. And what I'd like to show you now is just a short clip of the verdicts from the three judges. And um, then we'll do some question and answer, which is my favorite part. Thank you. Did you kill Jaquetta Thomas? I absolutely did not kill Jaquetta Thomas. And as far as I know, I've never even seen her alive. She, you know, and I'm sorry for, for anybody who has to go or, or who did go through something like that. But uh, that case or this case should have really meant no more to me than, you know, than to anybody else who, who would have read the paper, you know, the next day and, and seen the report on that crime.
pause from our remembrance that I you now sent us to life in prison. And Greg's mouth is just a little fellow. And then he turned around and looked at us, and it's just, just pale, pale white. It's just, just believe. What I fell to, you know, was, I guess, the, the onset of denial. This can't be happening type deal. I guess, you know, that was a shock of, you know, how to, how to people and, you know, deal with traumatic episodes in their lives. I guess there's some sort of barrier that goes up and something went up at that moment and it hasn't come down since. I know that.
incredible, incredible moment. And there's nothing I can compare it to because it's the most indescribable. It's, you know, you go through life and, you know, you do things like, you know, my wedding was an amazing day. It was the most, you know, beautiful, fun day. And then, like, the birth of my son was an incredible, you know, <laughs> work without him, you know, was the, the best. But, you know, just hearing that verdict was just something that it was just completely different than either one of those because it was just so much stress leading up to it. It was just so stressful. And just to want something so bad but to be so powerless, like, to, to what actually the decision was, you know, whether I was sitting there or not, you know, I, I couldn't do anything in that. I couldn't. All the wanting in the world can't, couldn't make those judges, you know, say what I wanted them to. So to finally hear that all those prayers have been answered, I just really, it was, it was amazing. <laughs> to celebrate this wonderful day with Greg Taylor and his amazing, loving, devoted family. What a great day. Thank you. But now I don't shut up. So, um, I like showing that video because um, hearing that word innocent was the first time that it had been heard in a ruling by a three judge panel in US history. Um, that it wasn't that the charges were simply dropped or that I was found, quote, not guilty you know, by a jury, but I had to prove that I was innocent by clear and convincing evidence. And um, so that's, that's what we did. Uh, to prevent that ruling from being made, the district attorney of Wake County offered me time served the second day of that hearing. But I turned it down because this was my chance for the truth to prevail. And I wasn't about to give up that chance, even if it meant dying in prison. Um, throughout the years, I had a lot of opportunities to go free. All I had to do was make up a story against my co-defendant. Um, they offered to drop the charges. They offered to not carry me to trial. They offered me a plea bargain. They offered me to get out of prison all throughout the years. And every time I would go back into court, the prosecutor would say something like, I don't know what he's wasting our time for. He knows how to help his own self out. But as it was, you know, I knew my co-defendant had no part of that crime. I knew I had no part of that crime. So I wasn't about to make up a story to, uh, to get out. Um, as uh, Joe Cheshire says, innocent affects the whole community. Um, we'll start with my family, my family who supported me all those years, who had, who drove like every weekend to wherever I was housed at, be it Nash or Johnston County for this one hour visit. Um, they hired attorneys, spent over $140,000 on attorneys and investigators to no avail. They, uh, talked to media. They did everything they possibly could for me over that period of that time. My daughter, who was nine years old when I went to prison, you saw when I was exonerated, was 26 years old. The first thing I missed was her 10th birthday. And I missed all these Christmases. I missed her 16th birthday. I missed her high school graduation. I missed her college graduation. I missed her marriage 
where she walked down the aisle by herself because she said nobody could take my place. I missed the birth of my first grandson. The community, there's a murderer out there somewhere. Who knows how many other crimes have been committed? So, you know, this affects everybody. Your tax money, housing innocent people in prison. Um, and the fact is that the system is made up of humans and humans are gonna make mistakes. So the reason why I'm standing here is because I hope that we can correct those mistakes to prevent the next innocent person from going to prison. Um, but I think my favorite part of doing these things is to hear from you guys and I hope there's some good questions out there or even some bad ones where they say there's no such thing as a bad one though. So uh, I look forward to hearing from you and also uh, I understand that maybe we can talk to the other campus as well, is that correct? So uh, that would be really cool to have a question from them as well. That would be a first. So uh, should we start in here? You've got one from online. Okay, there you go. Was there an investigation into prosecutorial misconduct and an investigation into how the police handled the case? There, there were uh, numerous investigations. Um, most of what was discovered through uh, my exoneration was discovered beforehand, and, and namely, there was one piece of evidence that tied me to the victim, which was a spot that was on the vehicle of my truck. The, uh, the, the SBI uh, gathered this spot, which had uh, reacted to a, a substance called phenolphthalein, which is a presumptive test. Basically, if it reacts to phenolphthalein, they carry the spot back to the lab and do confirmatory testing. So they did confirmatory testing on this spot and it was tested negative for blood, negative for human blood, but they filed a report with the Wake County prosecutor that said that this spot gave chemical indications for the presence of blood. So with that, that allowed the prosecutor to argue to the jury that I could not be telling the truth. The victim's blood was on my truck. Um, in 2010, the lab report was discovered where the technician for the SBI tested the spot, did the confirmatory testing, which was negative. He noted in his bench notes that there was an insect body found nearby that spot. And then we did DNA testing on that spot and there was 0.00% human DNA in that spot. So basically the SBI back in 1991 filed a deceptive laboratory report and there was uh, been numerous changes to the crime lab and policy in North Carolina that culminated in the Forensic Sciences Act. So that was one thing that came out of my case. Um, very difficult to prove prosecutorial misconduct um, and, or ineffective assistance of counsel. And the police have a lot of leeway into how they go about conducting investigations um, just by, uh, um, you know, I guess, educating themselves over the years. Things have changed a lot in that regard since 1991. But, but nevertheless, uh, you know, there's still some work to go. Thank you. Where was that from? That was from an online student. We oh. Have more if you, oh, great. How about, how about right there, sir? Yes. I'm just wondering how much time you serve in the state. Has anybody compensated you for 17 years? Ms. Knight, life got married. Is Ms. Knight income? There is a North Carolina general statute that when a person is exonerated, they are allowed $50,000 per year up to 15 years or $750,000. So with that, I, I kind of gave them two years free. But uh, the compensation in North Carolina, while not the best in the nation, certainly not the worst. And um, I feel, feel very fortunate that, uh, you know, number one, that things work out, and number two, that, that I was able to uh, to receive something, you know, after all those years. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. And if, actually, sorry to interrupt. If we could have those interested in asking questions line up by the microphone so that we could hear the questions.
questions, that would be great. So if you have a question for Mr. Taylor, please come down to either mic. Hey, I was wondering, like, after seeing what we all just saw right now, yeah. my faith in, ju in the justice system is a little shook right now. I was wondering, how, what's your perspective on after suffering through 17 years of, you know, being in jail innocent? Well, thank you very much for that. Um, when I first was arrested and when I first approached the police, I believed in the system, you know, and, and my experience was what I saw on TV was that the detectives got it right, the jury got it right, and, and justice was always served. I believed in the system when I went to trial. I even believed in the system after I was convicted and that my case would be overturned on appeal, but, but come to find out the appellate process is not even about guilt or innocence, it's about procedure and, and whether or not I was legally wrongfully convicted is what it amounted to. Um, today, I believe that the system is great. I believe that the system gets it right an astronomical amount of time, but also that there are instances where the system gets it wrong. And you know, who knows what percentage that might be, 1%, 5%, or whatever, but when, the times when it gets it wrong, are the times that um, you know that that you know keep me awake at night and keep me talking to you guys because it's important for people to uh, just know that it does happen and that hopefully there there will be some uh, you know in the future you know you guys if you go to work in law enforcement you go to work in law or you're just a you know a juror listening to a case you know to keep that just that certain seed that says, you know, maybe that guy, that jailhouse witness up there might not be telling the truth. That would be a start, right? Thank you very much for that. Um, I have two questions. One, um, have you ever received a, um, an apology from those who convicted you? And two, even though you're innocent, do you still identify as a prisoner? Uh, do I'm sorry, what was the second one? Even though you're innocent and you always knew you were, do you still identify as a prisoner? As a prisoner? Yes. Um, so the apologies haven't really come. Um, at the moment the verdict was announced, the district attorney and the prosecutor walked over to you know, my defense table and apologized. But apparently that's like some sort of uh, formality in the after the heat of battle. I think the prosecutor described in the documentary like after a soccer match. So uh, the apology went about as far as you know the wind could carry it at that time and that was it. Um, do I identify as a prisoner? Um, it was a large chunk of life that I spent in prison and the person that walked out of prison is not the person that walked in. So I, I had to accept you know, those years and you know, count my blessings that you know there was no additional trauma on top of the wrongful conviction. I, I stayed out of trouble. I had no infractions, and um, you know, and I tried to do the little things while I, I could while I was in there. That hopefully, that if I walked out of prison one day, I could look back, you know, with no regrets. And and so with that, I do identify with uh, prisoners with um, the people that I met while I was in there and, you know, and of course who I became while I was in there as well. Thank you. Hey, hello there. Um, so you went in one way, do you think you came out another way? Like how, how do you perceive yourself? Um, how do you think you came out differently? Good question. Definitely there was, there were, there were times of realization when I was in prison that that uh, I, I knew this was gonna be life changing. Um, for example, in the beginning I was very angry, uh, very bitter, uh, very depressed. I lost like 50 pounds in the first six months I was there. Um, eventually, you know, it, prison just became a, a way of life, you know, another day in the nut house, as we used to say. And, you know, it was during some of those times when I could look back and I could say, you know, Greg, you're not looking at this like you did when you first went in. You know, so there's no way that you're going to be able to, to be that person again. Um, the person that went in was very social. 
um, outgoing, the person that walked out, not so much. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, recognize there are certain ways that people deal with grief. I uh, read a book uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote about the five stages of dealing with grief, which were like den denial, anger, bargain, and depression, and acceptance. And sometimes I say I made it up through depression and kind of hovered there for about 15 years. But, um, but nevertheless, yeah, it was definitely life-changing. I lost a lot, lost everything while I was in there, you know, my family, my career, and essentially was reduced to a, a AM, FM radio and a couple of pens and pencils and, and, and left it at that. The uh, prison doesn't distinguish the innocent people from the guilty people. I, you know, so I was treated exactly like I was guilty all those years. Um, and d you know, despite what is portrayed in the in the uh, the movies or in media things, people really don't go around saying I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, because you know, like 97 percent or whatever of the people in prison are guilty. So you're not going to you know try to stand apart from that. Um, so I, people just basically say nothing. You know, they get up, they go to their job assignments. They go back to the dorm at night, and that's exactly what I did. And, and even just you know living around um, criminal people all those years, and learning how to um, accept certain behaviors that you normally wouldn't be exposed to uh, will change a person as well. But yeah, so it did change me. And um, you know, but but it, but. Uh, you know, regardless of what happens in life, you know, there's chunks of life that are going to make a pe person what they are today, and that's that's what I have to deal with as well. So, thanks. I have one more thing. I just, um, there's this movie called The Shawshank Redemption, <laughs> and Morgan Freeman, he spent so many years in prison, yeah. and he kept going to appeals and getting rejected, and, you know, it kind of reminds me of your story. So what made you hold on so long and hang on to that faith that you'll be able to get out one day? And my, my attorney calls me Shawshank <laughs> sometimes. Um, uh, I guess the, the, the whole library thing, right? And, uh, and I wish I had a thought about the whole poster and the hole in the wall and, and all that. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, at the beginning, what kept me going was holding on to what I had, and then once that was gone, the only thing I had left was the truth. And there was at some point where I was just became more resolute that you know that one or two things was going to happen: either I was going to die in prison, or the truth would prevail. And you know, so that was just my simple. I even had that message written on my locker: the truth will prevail. And even the times when I did not believe that, you know, it stayed on my locker and. Um, and, you know, luckily that was the uh, outcome. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my boyfriend's family currently has a difficult situation that they're dealing with. It's not quite to the extreme of your situation. Um, it's a divorce case, but it's gone very terribly now. Cases, I'm sure many of you are familiar with one party acting irrationally and making up stories for their own benefit. But in this case, it is the actual justice system that is very heavily going along with false accusations without any proof. Um, this, this case has been going on for three and a half years, and it was just decided about a month ago that. Boyfriend's father, who owns the property that they live on, which is a 15 acre farm, as well as rights to their hay delivery business. And he was basically told that 100% of everything, even everything he owned prior to the marriage, was to be signed over to his ex wife. And he submitted a polygraph test. She refused. Um, the defense, him and his attorney, they were never allowed to speak. He answered a total of three questions about his relationship to the kids who are all grown and have kids of their own. And 
basically, this this is just a, the entire case is has evolved beyond just the divorce itself. It's it's about the judge now and the injustice that the defense has had to suffer from based on um, both racial and sexist prejudice against the defense. Which is a, is a good example of how this is prevalent in all aspects of the system from civil proceedings all the way through the, the criminal justice and um, a, attorneys in general are overworked, underpaid, sometimes they don't get exposed to the correct information, judges the same way. Um, you know, and I, and I feel for anybody of course that goes through something and the truth does not prevail and um, you know, it, sometimes things look really, really, really um, dismal, I guess, at a certain point in time, but there's always, hopefully, an opportunity to, to better that in, in some way. Um, you know, but it takes people who are in the system, experienced with the system, to be able to, to, to facilitate those outcomes, good attorneys, good judges, good investigators, and, and unfortunately, sometimes those things are hard to find. Um, and I do wish you luck in that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time today. Um, I have two questions. I know you said you were the first. Um, the firm. Mm -hmm. You were the first person of your program to be uh, declared innocent. Yes. So was anyone else uh, ever declared innocent after you? And whatever happened to your co-defendant? Uh, good question. I always keep that open to see if you guys are paying attention. <laughs> um, the first is that the, there has been other that have gone through the Innocence Inquiry Commission. And, in, and my attorney who speaks of the other cases and sometimes will speak with me knows the exact statistics. But, you know, out of like, thousands and thousands of claims that the Innocence Inquiry Commission has received. There's been maybe a dozen exonerations since 2010. Um, the second uh, question, which I love to talk about, is the charges against my co-defendant were dismissed in 1993. The reason why the charges were dismissed was because on the dismissal form it says, this defendant did not make incriminating statements to a jailhouse witness. So you've got two people who were arrested for the same crime, put in different jail cells with the same evidence against them. The difference is that the cell block I was in, somebody stuck their head up out of a hole, read the newspaper, watched the news, listened to gossip, made up a story, went to the police and said, look what Greg told me. So uh, that's the reason why I was brought to trial, and that's the reason why my co-defendant was not. Um, I was offered after, well, at the point in time the charges were dropped on my co-defendant, uh, I was in prison, had a life sentence. The prosecutor wrote me and said that if I will testify truthfully against my co-defendant, then the prosecutor and the judge would go to the governor and get my sentence commuted. I could go home. And I wrote him back. I said, I said, I'll testify truthfully. I said, you can give me a polygraph that you never gave me. You can give me truth serum, hypnosis, and I'll prove to you with your own evidence that what I'm saying is the truth, and that's what I'll testify to. And he wrote back, and he said, that's unacceptable. He said, they're going to be forced to drop the charges on my co-defendant. And if in the future I should change my mind, then the offer still stands. So with that, the charges against my co-defendant were dismissed in 1993. So at that point, you have two people arrested for the same crime, one serving a life sentence, the other one the charges are dismissed. To me, even the most basic look at a system from somebody who claims to believe it's 100% correct, they can't justify how one person would be serving a life sentence and the other not, in fact, just went free. So with that, um, that's a good example, I think, that, that the system, it, you know, in its whims is not correct all the time. 
So I was going to ask the, uh, the Where's that coming from? Question, but, uh, oh, great. How you doing? Nice to see you. But uh, I guess another good question is um, specifically, uh, do you, I mean, after this experience, do you have, do you think that detectives, when they were, you know, interrogating you know, a gang accusatory, do you think they were um, rushing to get a, uh, I guess, a suspect that they could arrest? Do you think that they were just looking for someone that they could get off their pocket, you know, climb off their pocket? Um, do you think that's something that happens in other parts of the uh, justice system? That's a good question. Um, in, in fact, during my, in my hearing in front of the three-judge panel, there is a, a guy by the name of uh, Greg McCreary, who's a, uh, he started a, a FBI special crimes unit. So he's got like 30 years of law enforcement experience. And he looked at my case and the way it was handled by the detectives. And he said, quote, a rush to judgment. And um, the, one of the buzzwords they kept using uh, was a tunnel vision. So what they had is they had a, 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 a body, a victim, and 100 yards away, they had a vehicle. And right away, they assumed that there was a connection between that victim and the vehicle. So all they sought to do was establish that connection. And everything that they found that disproved that connection, they ignored and stayed right along that tunnel and only uh, uh, presented the, the uh, evidence that they could acquire through one way or another, a jailhouse lie or whatever, that would uh, con supposedly confirm that connection. Um, but what this ended up doing as well is that it prevented them from following the proper procedures in a criminal investigation, which as it was described by Mr. McCreary in the hearing, starts out with the victim. You know, who knew the victim? Who was closest to the victim? And then works its way out to the community in general, you know, as they attempt to try to solve, you know, whoever murdered this person. So, um, so not only do they end up with the wrong person arrested by this rush to judgment and tunnel vision, but it prevents them from conducting the proper investigation so they can go back and to find out who actually did it. And this crime remains unsolved today. Thanks, that's a good one. Hi there. Hi. This is working for me. Um, first, I want to personally thank you for coming in today because these are things that we talk about in sociology. Right. And it's one thing for me to walk in every day and say, here are some statistics. And it's quite another to hear your story. I think it's valuable for all of us. I was wondering if you'd be willing to share about reentry, how difficult or easy it was to get back into life once released. Okay, gladly. Um, the moment that a verdict, the last one was announced, and I just kind of come up out of this chair, you know, out of elation, and all that frustration and confusion of, of, of fighting my case, all those years went away, you know, in, in just that instant. And there was that period of, of elation that lasted, you know, uh, through days or, or weeks or whatever, but at the same time, this new kind of frustration and confusion started seeping in. And that was, you know, how do I live in a world that I don't understand or know anymore? Um, there, there are three things that I look at usually. And the first are those things that I haven't dealt with in so many years that are out here that um, I have to get reacquainted with, like eating with a fork or sitting in a soft chair or things like, you know, deciding what to wear or whatever. And then there are those things that um, are totally new uh, the technology, the cameras without films, the GPSs, the cell phones that are like, you know, supercomputers anymore that fit in your pocket. So uh, um, all, the, all these things I had to learn, and not only learn, but also had to learn how that changes everybody socially. I think I've, I've heard teachers say today about how, you know, they stand up in front of a class and everybody's looking at their crotch. <laughs> looking at a cell phone. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, that sort of thing. And then there are the things that are out here that um, I'm familiar with, but have changed to the point that they're, they're kind of irrelevant. Uh, my memory of them, like when you drive by a, a certain landmark, but everything around it has changed. And so that the landmark and its uh, perspective and what you understand is, is doesn't mean anything anymore. I mean, 
you know, to even just come into this campus is, uh, you know, where did this come from, right? Um, and this is from somebody that grew up in, in North Raleigh, you know, not too far from here at all. Um, you know, then there, there are those aspects like I'm missing a whole generation, you know, and I talk a little bit about my daughter and, and, my, and my parents who were, you know, my age when I went into prison. And then when I get out, you know, I, I see this responsibility of, of caring for them and their, their, you know, their, their elderly years. And, you know, and I don't really understand how to be middle-aged myself. So uh, there's a lot of uh, adjustment um, from the simplest aspects, just getting used to decision making. I can remember uh, opening up my daughter's refrigerator and thinking, yeah, you know, I get to, I get to eat what I want now. And, and all these decisions just jumped out, you know, the food and what to put on it and what to serve and what to eat it with. It just kept going until I closed the refrigerator. I wasn't even hungry anymore. Um, so there's a lot of adjustment for reentry. And the only way really to get through that effectively is by having the support from the family, friends, community in general, or whatever. And I've been real fortunate in those regards. Thank you. Sociology? Great. Okay. I took public speaking at uh, Nash Correctional, and I used to say that you know, out of 215 hours at a community college, who would have thought the little public speaking class would have been the one that, that I used? <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that when you were going through your interrogation, that as soon as you mentioned that your co-defendant was by the detective's eyes lit up. Yeah. And you also mentioned that at certain points, they would come to you and offer you a deal if you would testify against your co-defendant. To what degree do you think race was involved? That as soon as, you know, it's like, they focused in on you two because they found out he was black, mm -hmm. and then it's almost as though they felt like they could get you to, to turn against him, that that would somehow make their case stronger. Do you think race played a part? Absolutely, as as I do. And, um, you know, from that moment, I don't think it really registered um, exactly what kind of a role race would play, but there was no doubt, you know, this look, this gleam, in, you know, in this detective's eyes, you know, he could not hide this expression. It's kind of like what it reminds me of, if, it's, if you're sitting around a card table, you know, and here's the, here's the poker player that he's just got the royal flush, you know, and, and that's kind of the way he played it. So, um, you know, whether things would have worked out any different, who knows, but there's no doubt in my mind that at that point when I uh, informed the detective that who became my co-defendant and the guy I was with was black, then that interrogation took a different turn. And, and um, they never went after Johnny Beck in the same manner they went after me. They were a whole lot more passive in his interviews and, and I think at one point they might have tried, you know, hey, you know, Greg tells us something different. And Johnny, who had more experience with the system or what, he says, well, you got to show me that. <laughs> you know, so he didn't, you know, he didn't play that route one way at all. But with me, they, they, they kept coming at me, you know, with these offers and these deals and, you know, we know you did it, this kind of thing, and, and the pressure and, and, um, and, and the outcome was, of course, uh, the worst. It's not. It's not typically what you expect, and you're in. You know, in the, the situations where um, you know racism does become a factor. But yes, I believe that I was, in effect, a, a victim of racism because of the way this investigation was handled, and um, in its outcome. Yes. Yeah. I'd like to thank you all so much for the with us. Thank you. Two part question for you. I heard you say earlier uh, how cooperative you were with the authorities investigating and you had nothing to happen. And um, still have to make it at that time. Um, how does that affect you as far as your trust for police officers? And the second question is um, you seem to be very informative now since you've been through it as far as uh, how to how one could seek the help to be vindicated if innocent of such a crime. 
do you have a website or do you advocate on behalf of others that suffer this injustice that you did? Absolutely. Thanks for asking me that. The, the first question was about the respect for authority. And when I went into that police uh, officer's interrogation room, I uh, flashed back to an experience that I had had, you know, like several years before where I was in court for a traffic violation. And, you know, they parade, uh, I know you probably know how they parade people in front of the judge. And um, the guy that went in front of me was apparently a little bit uh, uncooperative with the officer. And the judge told that guy, he said, son, he says, there's three things you say to an officer of the law. Yes, sir, no, sir, and I don't know, sir. And I tried my best during the beginning of that interrogation to say those three things. Yes, sir, no, sir, and I don't know, sir. And of course, they ask you questions where those three answers don't apply. But at all times, I was as, as respectful as I knew how to be to these officers because they had a, you know, what I believed to be an important job to do. And, and I know I had the truth on my side. And it was just my duty to tell them everything I knew so that they can move on and find out who committed this crime. Um, that respect. I think is still there, although there's a, a certain amount of, you know, a distance that I would love to keep between myself and authorities, <laughs> and, uh, and that they have an important job to do, and I could hope that, that they adhere to their training and sometimes disregard what would be those human instincts that lead them down the, the wrong path, the tunnel vision and the rush to judgment, that kind of thing that they're trained to, to avoid. Um, with regards to advocating, uh, the North Carolina Center on Actual Innocence is a nonprofit organization in Durham that I first applied to in 2004, and um, I can be reached through that website, nccai.org, and there's myself and about a, a half a dozen other exonerees that the center has helped out and their profiles. Um, uh, of our cases on, on this site, and also that uh, there, you know, there's contact information on that site that they can reach me through that. Through that. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming and sharing your story with me. Um, I did have two questions for you. The first one is, do you hold any resentment towards the system? And the second is, looking back on the interrogation process, is there anything you would change, like something you shouldn't have said or have said? Um, and if so, what is your piece of advice to the audience? Okay, the first question is the resentment. And, you know, as, as difficult as it is to say that that resentment left a long time ago, um, and it did not leave easy, that you know, the reason why I had to make a conscious effort to get rid of that kind of resentment and bitterness was because my family would come to visit me and they would leave visit worse off than when they got there. And whose fault was that, right? <laughs> so I had to try to learn you know, how to, uh, to deal with this without making it any more of a problem on them than it, than it, than it already was. So, uh, so with that, you know what they say, fake it till you make it or whatever. So that's kind of like what I had to do. And eventually um, uh, other, other things came up that I could resent as well. So um, I kind of focused on them. <laughs> um, with the uh, uh, advice for interrogation and, you know, one, the one thing looking back I wish I had have understood more was that the difference between an interview and a custodial interrogation. An interview, you're free to leave. A custodial interrogation, you're not. Um, at the point that it's a custodial interrogation, which I guess rights have been uh, mentioned and that sort of thing, then you can stop that interrogation. When I requested a lawyer and they kept on going, I didn't have to keep right on going with them. You know, I could have said, hey, look, I said I want a lawyer here, and I want a lawyer here, and let it go at that. You know, but with somebody, and that's, the, the system's not set up for innocence. It's, you know, it's set up 
for, for guilty people. And as a, a guilty person, you'd have opportunities to, to help yourself out throughout the process, you know. You could take that plea, you could testify against a co-defendant, you could do things in prison to help get you out quicker. But um, as an innocent person, when your hands are tied to the truth and you know nothing about the system, then, you know, at the point of the interrogation, all you're trying to do is just get them to understand the truth when all they're trying to do is figure out a way to arrest you. You know, it doesn't work. Um, so, yeah, so it would have been good probably to just say, hey, look, you know, um, I, I believe I have the right to an attorney and that's where we're going to leave it at this point. Um, regarding the rights, it wasn't like one of those, you know, dragnet, you have the right to remain silent kind of things. It was like when they went to search my house, they presented a piece of paper. Well, this is just a formality that gives us the right to search your house. And I was like, well, search my house. And I signed away. And when I signed away, I signed away uh, a waiver to, to those uh, specific rights to allow them to keep right on going without the presence of an attorney. But I could always get that attorney in my presence you know, at any point you know, in the process after that. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, so obviously, you know, you're innocent. Um, so my question to you is, when you were presenting your cases and trying to appeal to the Supreme Court, why did they deny you? Like, there couldn't be a more clear case that you were innocent. Yeah, but you know, the, there were four things which I didn't really go into that um, were uh, issues on my conviction. And one of them was the blood spot, which I did mention. There were two jailhouse uh, liars, and then there was a, a crime scene dog that wasn't trained to do what it did. And the handler was like, you know, well, we can't do this. They were trying to link the victim scent to my vehicle is what it came down to, but that was um, a non-issue at this point. So. They have uh, these four pieces of evidence from the trial, and then they, apparently the Attorney General's office recognized under Mike Easley, who he's the guy with the felony on his record, by the way, um, that uh, there was a, a fifth bit of evidence, supposedly, and that is that during the interrogation, I was showed a picture of the victim from the, the, a close up from the, the, the uh, shoulders up. And the officer said, this woman died a horrible death. Somebody's gonna pay a hell of a price. And he shows this picture and he just sits there silent. And I look at the picture and it's, it's, there's all this blood about the neck and shoulders area. And, and, you know, and I'm sitting there and he's just saying nothing holding that picture. And finally I was like, well, well how did she die? Did somebody cut her throat? And um, the interrogation continued and the attorney general's office argued that there was no way I could have known that the victim's throat was cut unless I was actively participating in the crime or in the immediate vicinity while the crime was, was uh, occurring. Um, the autopsy names the, uh, the reason for all this blood about the neck area was a severe and crushing blow to the neck that was so severe that it broke vertebra in the back of the neck, left a one and a half inch gaping wound, and that was the source of all the blood. The victim's throat was not cut. So my conviction and the, the, the Supreme Court judge um, ruled, Burley Mitchell, said that if I see a reason to keep him in, this is it. And basically my conviction was upheld because I asked a question about a wound that never occurred according to the autopsy based on looking at a picture. If you're confused about that, believe me, <laughs> I spent a lot of years thinking about it. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Oh, great. Thank you.
uh, gratitude for you being the first in our, uh, I would say, inaugural college-wide lecture series. Great. So thank you again. Hey, thank you. Also, I'd like to recognize a special faculty member who was instrumental in helping us get Mr. Taylor here, Ms. Joanne Clee. Please, thank you. As well as, again, recognizing members of the uh, lecture series committee, Ms. Kristen Williams and Mr. Wayne Nagel. They say, am I missing anyone? Lee Corbin, yes, Lee Corbin, <laughs> right here. Sorry. As well as Dean Lewis. Thank you all. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Please be sure to sign out or sign in, whichever one you want to uh, think of it as. Uh, on the sheets, we have the tables. So uh, please make sure you, uh, you sign out for the class today. And thank you for coming. Y'all are great. Appreciate it.